Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emission uh, flows, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and today we're going to try to uh, explore the relationship between how, on the one hand, we use uh, resource users and we emit pollution, and how they are associated with certain infrastructures and stocks. That's on the one hand. And on the other, what is the service that they provide to society? So what we're really trying to understand here is when we think about the future and what is needed in order to operate our societies, what is the minimum amount of flows and stocks that we need to do so? To talk about this topic, uh, I have a colleague researcher, Dominic Wiedenhofer. Dominic is a senior scientist in the Institute of Social Ecology at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Boku. Uh, and his work uh, has focused on developing techniques to better account for societal uses of materials and energy and its link in the ongoing accumulation of manufactured capital. So we're going to investigate together the role of consumption, uh, also the link between resource use and emissions across different uh, end users. Uh, we might touch upon as well inequality, affluence, and also the, the options of, uh, of agency. Just before kicking off this episode, I will encourage you to continue this discussion after we finish this conversation online. So don't hesitate to drop an email to, to Dominic to tell him what you thought about the episode. With all that being said, Dominic, welcome to the podcast. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. <laughs> yeah, we, we're in Vienna right now. It's actually great to be at the end of this uh, international society uh, International Society of Industrial Ecology Social Ecological Metabolism Conference. And we've met over many years uh, through these conferences. Perhaps you can explain a bit how you uh, work in these topics, uh, what do you do, and what is SEM, perhaps? <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yes, so um, basically for me, the, the entry point into all of this research was my interest to understand what are the structural conditions that we need, need to have a sustainable life. Mm. So what are the options and what are the ways to make sustainable practices the easier way to live? Because right now it's the opposite way. So if we think about mobility, it's often easier to take the car, mm. which is about infrastructures, which is about public transport systems, which is about the rules and the regulations we have around it. So these are the topics that really got me interested. And when starting my research, I realized that um, it's, it's really important to see the, the, the complexity of the, as we call it, the metabolism mm. or how social systems, how societies are connected with the environment via complex networks. If you think about global trade, which is a very complex network <laughs> connecting the cities, to production in other places, to production in the hinterlands. So to be able to actually describe these relations and to model them, you need tools and you need to develop these techniques and the data for that. So that was that was really my entry point. Mm. And as a second kind of research line, I then started to develop uh, so-called stock flow models. So basically where you look at the accumulation of buildings, infrastructures, cars, machines, and try to model how much they are, what they do for society, and especially how they lock us into certain patterns of resource use. Mm. So basically coming back to the structural conditions, yeah. but thinking more about what, what locks us into the way we currently operate as a society, and how can we change these lock-ins? Because obviously there could also be sustainable lock-ins. Yeah. <laughs> right now we have a lot of unsustainable ones. Uh, so the, these, these are my motivations and, and for these purposes I'm developing a lot of uh, modeling tools mm -hmm. to be able to describe the global economy in its, in its interlinkages and to be able to describe these stock flow relations for countries but also for cities. So here for Vienna we are doing projects with the city of Vienna, mm -hmm. trying to look at the urban metabolism of Vienna in relation to 
the rest of the economy, the rest of Austria. Yeah. So these are the, the, the pr approaches we are mostly using. And what I find really interesting and inspiring about this community and the metabolism approach is that it is in very interdisciplinary setting. So we, we all realize the boundaries <laughs> or the limits of what we are doing yeah. and we reach out to other people yeah. to make things more interesting. So for example, one thing we are doing is to look at um, spatial planning tools, how they are applied in Vienna and how they might improve the quality of life in cities, how they might reduce traffic, what that means for the resource use required to transform the yeah. city, and then do, for example, interviews with uh, policymakers and other stakeholders to understand their motivations and their reasons for either implementing projects or not implementing them. So kind of reaching out to more social science informed mm -hmm. approaches, also taking into account the, the perspectives of the people actually acting <laughs> yeah. uh, on the resource flows that, that I might be modeling. Yeah, um, I think of course one of how people might know you uh, is through your, well, as you said, the accounting uh, techniques and the accounting data sets as well. Um, I think, you know, perhaps we can help people to, to get a better idea of the magnitude of flows that we're dealing with at a global economy and perhaps we can go even further at a national level. but. Uh, you know, th your team has developed for a long time these data sets th that now is used also by the IRP, the, so the International Resource Panel. Um, could you also just remind us a bit what is the sheer magnitude of mm -hmm. flows that are mobilized by our global economy? What mm -hmm. are they and how they have mm -hmm. evolved perhaps over the last uh, century? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so <clears throat> one of the things that, that my team and also others obviously um, together developed is something which is called economy-wide material flow accounting, which mm -hmm. is a, a method to measure the resource use of economies in a comprehensive way and in a consistent way, which mm. means that you need methods that you can apply for many countries and over many years mm. so that you get a consistent assessment and can really compare resource use dynamics, resource use productivity. And that's a framework that is, as you said, now used by IRP and by Eurostat. That's uh, also part of the sustainable development indicators. Yeah, that's uh, what, uh, number 12 or the DNC? Yes, in, in yeah. the, so we have in the sustainable production and consumption, yeah. um, we have the material footprint and the national resource use, the domestic material consumption as indicators in there, which are really helpful starting points because it allows you to see how much we extract from the earth. And that includes all the biomass that we use to feed ourselves, to mm -hmm. feed our livestock. Uh, it includes all the so-called non-metallic minerals, so what we need for construction like sand and gravel, concrete, bricks. Um, then also all the metals and the extraction of them, so that's mining is a very big environmental issue, so be able to account for these. And also fossil fuels, obviously, mm -hmm. that's also mm -hmm. an important energy carrier but at its point of extraction it's a material that has to <laughs> yeah. be dug up and then transformed yeah. before we can actually use it for energy and if we look at the global situation right now we see that resource use has been increasing exponentially mm -hmm. so it, it's a very steep curve it's going up all the time right now we are at about 90 gigatons per year so it's 90 with nine zero exactly tons exactly of, yeah. Um, so that's a lot of materials and what we see if we, if we zoom in is that basically in a lot of the s high income countries we see a relative stabilization of resource use but we see that the emerging economies, especially China, have mm. been driving global resource use massively because they are developing their cities, their infrastructures, providing proper housing and the supply networks that you need for basic services. So mm. it's a important thing to have yeah but still it requires a lot of resources and in one of my recent papers we actually showed that china for example now uses more than half of all the concrete more than half of all the steel of all the construction materials uh, so you mean globally from all all yes. of what is produced and extracted exactly yeah. yes and the the accumulation of material stocks so mm. all the buildings the infrastructure the machinery 
uh, in China, it's it's an explosive development, which is really singular in history, because mm. in our long-term studies, we see that usually economies kind of take decades to really accumulate the levels of stock that we have right now. So if we think about Europe, for example, there is a long history of building up everything. Yeah. China basically did that in 20 years. Yeah. And you see in the curves that right now, basically, they are... They have the so it's a very big country so mm -hmm. they have like half the global stocks and if you look at the already so yes. in 20 uh, and how was it before was it like very minimal and or yeah before i mean the, the longer you go back in history the more uncertain it is but <laughs> for a very long time they had a very very small amount but yeah. uh, you can actually see in these results that basically in the 80s they, they had the first acceleration mm. and then in the 90s and 2000s it really started to boom and now if you look at the stocks per capita, so for kind of the national average, you could say, you actually see that China has reached two thirds of the level that we enjoy here in the high income countries. So they're basically not far away from catching up. Yeah. Obviously, there is a lot of spatial inequality and disparities in China. So it's uh, it's the national averages always have to be treated a little bit carefully. Yeah. But I would say that, for example, on the west, on the coastline, where all the big cities are, that's they're basically at the level where we are here and I think mm. that explosive development is really important to understand because maybe a lot of people f still think that China is maybe at the factory of the world poor country and everything but it's not you know it's not anymore <laughs> and it, it will be really decisive how China continues so in our scenario modeling we really see that we hardly see signs for saturation so you would say okay. that saturation meaning that it's gonna asymptotically stop a bit like uh, well uh, countries like in europe yes. or the us because so over there there are signs of saturation uh the only signs of saturations that we really found were for the um, basically western european countries uh -huh. the so saturation we define it we say that the the total amount of stocks so buildings infrastructure all the machinery and goods they have to be stable mm. Because if we have stable stocks, then we don't need ever more resources. We can actually start to decrease our resource use because we only need to maintain, repair, replace, refurbish. Mm -hmm. And then that's also where the circular economy comes in, where a lot of these solutions really have potential. As long as we have a massively growing system, you need a lot of virgin resources. Yeah. And um, the saturation question, I think, is really crucial because that goes back to basic writing from ecological economics, industrial mm. ecology. So if you think about Herman Daly, steady state economics, there you also see already see the theoretical foundations that, that you, the, the, so to say the social system needs to be in balance with the planetary system. Mm. But if we always increase our resource use and our accumulate ever more stocks, which then lock us into certain practices, then there is no way of really stabilizing the system. And that's actually also a major challenge for climate change mitigation. As we have, we and others have shown, um, the amount of infrastructure and buildings catch up that you might expect if you think the world will kind of converge to a high level of infrastructure and building stocks that would be immense amounts of resources and probably incompatible with reaching the Paris climate goals. Mm. So we really need to think differently about how we build cities, how we build infrastructures, which kinds, how that happens in a lot of the countries of the world where there is insufficient infrastructure and buildings, but also how we start stop building more and more in the high income countries. So yeah. we still see, for example, Austria has a big problem because we are... S um, we are kind of a world leader in soil sealing. So we build ever more parking lots, ever more <laughs> roads, ever more houses. <laughs> Urban sprawl is maybe kind of the more known term for that. But the end, in the end, we see this endless expansion and it eats up land. It in encroaches on the bioproductive land that we have for growing food and feed, but it also impacts biodiversity. And that's a real challenge. So we really have to start thinking about how can we limit that growth how can we think about densifying city how can we think about transforming infrastructure systems that we need less mobility that you have um, kind of the chance that electrification really has benefits 
for climate change mitigation instead of fueling more and more and more. So yeah. in that sense, I think you see these this big disparities in the world and you see that China has a decisive role in the end because their, their dynamics are really driving global resource use. Mm. A lot of the other world regions are kind of slowly growing but not as explosively. And uh, so the next question then will be what's happening in India, what's exactly, happening exactly, in kind yeah. of other middle income countries. And we have a, a large share of the global population which is, is living in poverty and under supply. So that there need to be new solutions there also. I think just transplanting our model of development to other places is, is most probably not compatible with climate goals or biodiversity goals. So I think that new approaches are needed mm -hmm. and I really hope that our research here in the field can can help supply that knowledge. Yeah, and over there, so we said 90 gigatons, um, so it's what, uh, a third to a half, which is construction materials? Yes. I mean, could <coughs> you just give us some yes. share so yes, to, yes. to have an idea? So and construction, uh, so the non-metallic construction minerals, they usually make up a third to half of the national resource use. Yeah. Then you have a quarter, which is biomass, mm. mostly. A lot of the biomass is actually used to feed livestock. Yeah. And then we eat the livestock, <laughs> which is very inefficient <laughs> from an ecological point of view. So also here again, we see large potentials mm. from eating mes less meat, basically. That would massively impact our resource use and that would also enable feeding the world sustainably mm. that's research from my institute uh, where they show that other people also show that that the kind of changing diets is really important to to transform our resource use and to supply our social metabolism in a more sustainable manner yeah and so that's just so that we have orders of magnitude in mind i think we produce these 90 we extract these 90 gigatons then there is what 35 or 40 gigatons of emissions yes. as well yes and then how much is uh, is then goes to the well to the stock and how much of it is then produced as waste into that yes so currently we see that um, a little bit more than half of the resource use is actually used to process is, is processed into const into stocks basically yeah. so you okay. have the metals mm. where you have the extraction of ores where there is a lot of waste created then you have the metals which are really transformed into products you have all the construction minerals so you could say that actually i think the current the latest numbers are something like 60 percent of global resource use mm. we utilize to build more stocks <laughs> Which and in turn, and, uh, and then the rest of the resource, flows, right? I mean, exactly, yeah, they, yeah. they lock in the flows, which brings us to the fossil fuels. Because the fossil fuels, what do we do with them? Either we operate the stocks, so we run the machines, we heat our buildings, we run factories, or we transform the materials to build the stocks. That's so that there is that's the crucial lock-in. For biomass, you can also think it that way. So you have a stock of people, and yeah. they need to eat, so they also lock in the flows. So I think these, what we call the stock flow relations, are really important to understand. And I think that's a major frontier as for the entire field mm. um, to understand these relations much better because describing the stocks is it's um, not, not so easy to do because there is much less official statistics on it. It's much harder to track yeah. all of these things. For the resource use numbers that we mentioned here, you, you have much more information and also people have been working on that for decades now. Mm. So you have established methods um, for the stock uh, modeling. <laughs> that's something where I'm working a lot on yeah. to really extend that. And for the waste, you, you see that most of these materials then accumulate. So basically the waste that we see now most of it is basically very old stocks that we demolish or maybe buildings that are torn down prematurely and replaced by something else. So these are also significant quantities, but they will be much more significant in the future. So because we have more stock today, therefore we're going to have more of exactly. uh, waste in the future. Exactly. So there is kind of this, this time delay mm. in this system where you see basically that future outflows or future waste is what we built yesterday basically yeah and um so that's also a big challenge for the circular economy because you yeah. have to you need kind of materials at a high quality level and you need to be able to ensure that for example a house that you build also 
stands and doesn't crumble. Yeah. So if you have old materials, which might be mixed together stuff from <laughs> demolition, then it's not always so easy to really ensure the, the engineering properties that you need. So I think that's something also for the circular economy discussion, uh, mm. which is not so often acknowledged that actually dealing with what is already out there, which is already built, might be the much bigger challenge than designing new products which are very efficient. I think yeah. we, we are always very good at designing better products, but dealing with the past is... Yeah. <laughs> maybe we often put it under the carpet and we forget about exactly. all the dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, um, and that's for me also something, maybe coming back to the, the term that we are throwing around here, the social metabolism or urban mm. metabolism. I think for me that was also a very helpful approach to really look at societal resource use because it's it's very easy to to jump on a specific problem mm. that you find interesting so i don't know plastics pollution or lead um, um, emissions and stuff like that which is all very important mm -hmm. but from a socio-metabolic perspective you would say that actually society similar to a human body needs to reproduce itself so there is a lot of resources that we require just to basically keep our systems, our society, our economy running, and that necessarily produces waste and emissions. Yeah. So if we want less waste and less emissions, recycling is a good idea, but it's an even better idea to start with what you put into <laughs> society. Similar, you know, what you eat, yeah. that's how you, your body changes. So a society similar, what we put in will turn into a problem or will, might be managed well. Yeah. So that's a more kind of systems perspective where you would say that's a system that's reproducing itself and that's also why um, y you get a better understanding of, of how complex it is to really tackle climate change, for example, because you cannot just get rid of the emissions by, I don't know, burying them in the ground because <laughs> the fossil fuels are an integral part of our socioeconomic systems. So you cannot just replace them like mm. that. You know, yeah. that's why the energy transition is such a struggle and why there needs to be a lot of infrastructure transformation to be able to actually electrify everything, to have a lot of renewables in the system. So there is a lot of changes needed behind that, which will affect society. I think that that's for me really important to say it's it's not just about measuring the emissions out there. It's actually looking at ourselves, at our own social social systems. How do we organize? How do we work? How do we live? What are the conditions we create for ourselves? Yeah. Because these are the ones creating resource use and creating wastes and emissions in the end. So it, it turns the perspective away from only looking at the problem in the environment to <laughs> what is happening in society. Why, why do we operate like this and where really the the demand and supply side solutions to to make change yeah i mean of course you put your your finger in the problem which is the practices as well uh, and you have you, you're now building not only uh, you know the the stock and flow elements but also you link them to what are they used for yes and, well we can even push it further and are they useful <laughs> or or not yes. but perhaps before we answer that question let's go to the how are they used because I think this, we often just know how much is extracted, how much is imported, how much is wasted and all of that. Mm -hmm. But then perhaps we can think of, okay, what are some societal services that we need mm -hmm. and how do we allocate them into that? So can you give us a, I mean, you, you said construction a lot, but mm -hmm. uh, are there some other elements and how, how should we look about, you know, the, the nexus between our practices and the stocks and flows? Yeah, well, so <clears throat> um, I mean, I mean, one thing is that you you see from from the from the literature that basically mobility, housing, mm -hmm. and food are really basically two thirds to eighty percent of the environmental impacts and problems that we have. So it's really, I think, it's really important to f to start from that yeah. because very often in public discussions, you know, the discussion is about plastic bags, for example. <laughs> And it it's, uh, might be good to ban them. It might not be good to ban them. You know, but in and the also end, also the communication is you know a, a turtle with something around it. I, I think the the thing is that we we manage to put very strong images with plastic, yeah, uh, like on the sea pollution and also animals uh, degradation and all of that. But yeah. 
we also forget that carbon exists just everywhere yes. or you know the the pollutions with mm. of our economy are just in all of the pieces of activities that yes, we do exactly uh, exactly and i think here it, again we coming back to the interdisciplinary part for me that's also very exciting here because the stock flow modeling and the supply chain modeling that's kind of standard industrial ecology stuff which mm. is i really enjoy <laughs> but maybe others find not so exciting but when it comes to understanding society obviously you need social scientists and mm. there you can you can think about different perspectives so we started out with thinking that we can as kind of heuristic inspirational concept to say that stocks and the flows together provide services so if you have a house you mm. need some energy to heat it and then the service would be a well tempered room mm. so that would be a kind of a functional functionalist approach a little bit to see it in that way which is fine and there you can learn a lot about efficiencies in the system you can learn a lot for example there have been amazing studies looking at how much energy would we need mm. to supply the entire world with decent living standards yeah the, with julia and uh, and uh, rao right I mean, yes uh, yeah, exactly yeah. Uh, is a lot of work around Rao, yeah. um, which is really exciting and which also features in the latest ipcc report so mm -hmm. i think it's it's good to look at that um but it's it, it has it, it's one approach to look at it and then the other one would be um practices which is something which we recently started working with so it shifts the focus away from these kind of very specific things like living space or mobility or whatever and you start thinking about okay what what are practices and practices you would say they, they are a combination of meaning so what do we ascribe to certain activities to the competences that we have mm -hmm. and to the material base of them so for example um, if we think about mobility there is different mobility practices and you might say uh -huh. that uh, driving a car is associated with a cultural meaning so a car is much more than just a thing driving you around you know it transports it's your status freedom. Yeah, it's yeah. freedom it's uh, a lot of associations are attached to it and that makes it more or less attractive for a lot of people then there are the competences are you able to actually do that so ah. for example it's totally standard that everyone does a driving license because we're all expected to drive at some point so you you earn competences in social settings mm -hmm. and then link them to the meaning and then obviously the, the foundation of all of that is the material base so mm -hmm. um if there is no roads and no cars you know <laughs> your driving license you will be a little bit worthless um but if societies or if more and more people think that riding your bike is a cool thing to do and it has health benefits and it's good for the environment and it's nice to have some fresh air um, then that suddenly has a different status and the competences then being able there and then having driving having bike lanes mm. if that all combines well and it's if it's socially attractive then that kind of practice will be more successful in mm. recruiting people in actually doing that mm. so i think that's a that's another way of thinking about stock flow service relations because the service is we need to get around i mean that's yeah. there is no talking around that but what do we attach to it and that's a, another way to explore these things because i think for for social change we need more than 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 numbers or yeah <laughs> we need better arguments <laughs> than just being able to show that something would be more efficient mm. we need to understand why people do it or why people don't do it and it's a more complex understanding of people not the usual economist version where you say people are consumers and they optimize and they are rational and individualistic and whatever you have a huge <coughs> love for economists uh, as yeah. uh, you were saying yesterday night yeah well <laughs> yesterday yeah i i i think that uh, economists um a lot of the stuff that comes out of of economics uh, actually perpe perpetuates the problems that mm. we have i think um, but that's another big discussion <laughs> topic. I don't know if you want to go in there. And so that that's one perspective. And then, I mean, that's that's for me, it's an exploration to see what else we can think about. So what I found really interesting is I, I read a great paper about, um, so people might know the concept of toxic masculinity. Mm. So kind of uh, images of how a man should be. And often these are very like the strong guy, who is uh, doing stuff and pushes things through and is hard and doesn't show feelings. Yeah. These kinds <laughs> of images of what a man is. 
And there were some great studies looking at the relation between petrol, so they call it petrol toxic masculinity, between driving your car, having a big engine, having a loud motorbike, and how that connects to images of men. Mm. So you can easily test that, you know, whenever you confront people with the fact that we need to get away from car-based mobility on a large scale, <laughs> who will react super angry about it? And usually it's a little bit older white men <laughs> who get personally offended by the thought that they have to give up their SUV. Yeah. And they will be enraged about it. And on the next day they will be very worried about the future of their children, given climate change. But still it's so deep in their identity mm. part of their social identity that this is their way to express their status this is the kind of part of they worked so hard all their life to have all these things so i think it's important to un explore these different perspectives of understanding why do societies organize in the way they do why are certain things attractive why are certain things dominant in the way we do things and what could be leverage points to to affect change there and i mm. think that's a important kind of basic understanding or foundational understanding to really have broader develop broader sets of policies which don't narrow down to the consumers or don't narrow down to simple technological silver bullets that never work <laughs> um, <laughs> but to see it more broadly but obviously that's a very kind of broad political agenda then at some point because uh, we live luckily we live in democracies here so that there needs to be a negotiation process and, and a kind of um, democratic process behind that. So all of these perspectives really help understand why these processes also go the way they do, because the rational options are on the table and <coughs> yeah. rationally we know that it's much cheaper and easier to mitigate climate change instead of Ad adapting destroying, or uh, yeah. destroying everything so that's that's all proven you know that that's even you know even if you take mainstream economic models you can easily show that it's much more rational to avoid climate change but still it doesn't happen so <laughs> why doesn't it happen you know that's that's for me that's really interesting that's not not my field you know i'm yeah. not a social scientist but i really like these corporations because it really helps to put these things into perspective. But, uh, okay, perhaps we can go back to this because um, you said even mainstream economics now would mm -hmm. think that. Uh, you did a, a meta, mega meta paper on, um, <laughs> on why uh, decoupling doesn't work. Mm. Um, perhaps you can give us back a bit some background of, of this research. What is decoupling and what, what were the results of this two-part uh, paper? Yeah, thanks for asking. That was indeed quite the major effort. We, we, <laughs> we underestimated it a little bit <clears throat> at the beginning. But the, the basic idea is that that basically goes back to, to uh, literature and UNIP reports f from 10 years ago or so. So decoupling basically means that if you have economic growth, so more production, more consumption, um, we actually want resource use to not grow at the same rate as economic activity, but actually grow slower, mm -hmm. which we would call relative decoupling, or even to actually decrease. That would be absolute decoupling. So mm -hmm. you can imagine uh, if you have two lines, basically you see GDP going up and resource use going down. That would be ideal. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, in the UNEP framework, what they also said is that we should be more we should be get better at creating more well-being from production and consumption so another decoupling so to say you try to uh -huh. get better at creating well-being you try to reduce resource use and if we can then also decouple environmental impacts from resource use so climate change biodiversity impacts all of these things then that would be even better so to mm. say so there are <coughs> three types of decoupling somehow that, that, you, that you could do, right? Exactly. So there is different relations. So well-being, production and consumption, resource use, and then the damage to environments. And each of them ideally would be decoupled. Mm. And that's the basic framework for ideas such as green growth, um, for the environmental Kuznets curve. That's the same idea, just in a little bit different <laughs> framing in the end. Um, if you look at, for example, arguments about the uh, technological solutions they all aim at these kind of decouplings and that's um, underlying 
so many discussions and we decided to do a so-called systematic review, which means that you have a standardized procedure to collect basically all the literature that is out there, English language literature, because that's what, what we could read, um, which kind of mentions these words or does research on it. So we, I think we had something like 11,000 articles. Oh, God. I yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we assembled an international team, I think like 15 people f from all around the world who work together on this. And the first thing is that you screen all of these papers and you basically s select which ones really do empirical mm -hmm. work on the coupling on a kind of, we looked at those which do more kind of aggregate indicators. So you, there is lots of studies, I don't know certain specific air pollution in a city somewhere. So these are very specific. We excluded those. Yeah. We looked at national to global relations for energy, for material use, for greenhouse gas emissions. And we collected all of those and we, fo we found 830 papers. Out of the 11,000. Yes, so yeah. exactly. These ones were really relevant. And then we looked at those very closely. We assessed the quality. We looked at the main results, we looked at what insights come out of it. And for me, the, <clears throat> the really interesting part was, so, I mean, firstly, what we really saw is that a lot of the l literature is not well done <laughs> and that there is a lot of studies where people don't even understand what kind of measures they are actually using. Mm. So for a lot of studies, we had to dig into the primary sources to actually find out what they were doing there because there is so you redid 800 studies more or less from scratch just to yes. validate, yeah. Exactly. And what, what, what is really interesting from that kind of work is that, so firstly, we do see absolute decoupling in um, about 18 to 20 high income countries. Okay. We see this from a production based perspective and from a consumption based perspective. So the footprints are also absolutely decoupling in so this trade countries. is included in yes consumption. trade yeah. is included production in china is included all of these things are there that's kind of the supply chain modeling that we mentioned mm -hmm. um so th there is some signs that th there it's ongoing uh, these few papers which show that they also caution that th it's there is no automatic decoupling happening it's not a natural thing to just occur so most of these countries had environmental policies they were pushing decarbonization issues they were countries with established infrastructures and established cities so mm. they need also less resources because they're only slowly growing everything and not explosively growing everything yeah um, all the stocks so which are <coughs> some of these countries so you you have the northern european countries mm -hmm. you have the uk you mm -hmm. have uh, some of the germany france so a few of those countries um, and th what, what the thing is there that we see these things happening and one part is that it's not that this is automatically going to improve all the time. So for some of these countries, you see that there were like a periods of five to 10 years of absolute decoupling. Then for example, there was the global financial crisis. <laughs> what do governments do? They, they start refinance all of the they refinance everything and they start a lot of construction projects and investment projects to boost the economy resource use goes up again and the absolute decoupling is gone again <laughs> you know so that that can easily happen mm. you know? and the other part is that basically a lot of the footprints or the consumption based indicators are going down because the countries are cleaning up their own energy systems and china is aha, cleaning out aha. its production, yeah, relatively okay. cleaning okay. it up. So a lot of the major increases of the footprints that we have seen in the 2000s, where everybody was extremely worried, where globalization was fully rampant around the globe, that was basically China being the factory of the world, mm. as the saying goes. But now they are starting to clean up more and more, and that affects the footprints of the high income countries and actually makes them decrease. So we see some signs of hope. I mm. think that's that's a good thing. There is policy can work, measures can affect these resource use th and their emissions. It's by far not enough to reach the Paris climate goals, but it's going in the right direction. And I think that's really important. The other part, what we see, which is um, also fascinating to me is that we looked at various indicators because as we said 
material use is related to energy use. Mm. Without energy, nothing moves around, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and then you always have emissions. So there is these kind of interlinkages or these ne necessary dependencies. Mm. And what we see is that exergy, exergy is a measure of the, the work that energy really does for society. So for example, a warm room Hmm. We don't want fuel, we want a warm room. So Exergy measures how, we, how well we can warm the room or run a production process or move the car around. Um, Exergy is tightly coupled to economic growth. Mm -hmm. but which makes sense. Uh, yeah. Which makes right. sense, but which no, the, main eco the mainstream economists yeah. <laughs> usually don't think that. <laughs> um, and a lot of the decoupling that we have been seeing actually is because we are getting better at delivering exergy. Mm. So we are burning less coal, for example. We are getting more and more renewables in. These are very efficient energy sources. So you, so you get major decreases in primary energy use, therefore also in emissions, therefore also in other impacts and problems. So there we see progress, but it's limited. So as long as the economy is growing, we will need ever more exergy. So we will need more so that's that's kind of a growth push yeah and then on the other hand we are also decarbonizing relatively so we see some decouplings for the emissions happening um, because we are getting cleaner energy systems in so that's the good sign but i have to um, bring in some caution i mean <laughs> I, I was now talking about 18 countries which show good progress. We, we have another, I don't know, 160 countries around the world with many billions of people which are still building up, basically, and there you see hardly any decoupling. As in the majority of the world, you see... Uh, neither relative nor A little absolute. bit of relative, usually, yeah. but no absolute decoupling in these countries. Often, for example, in China, with the massive construction boom and everything in the 2000s, you actually saw that in the literature they call it hypercoupling so basically mm. resource use was increasing faster than economic growth so it kind of it was 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 yeah just a very different dynamic and very different kind of um, pathway of development that mm. countries are taking so basically a, a lot of these decoupling dynamics they, they are far not enough to reach climate goals they are not widespread enough to really say, okay, this is all going in the right direction, we're doing fine, there is so much more effort required. And the systematic review just shows a lot of the problems in these kinds of literature, it, it cautions a lot of warnings. Mm. And I think the main kind of policy conclusion that we would have from that is that only strong demand side and supply side measures in combination can deliver more decoupling it's not enough to only go efficiency, to only go technology. We need to think about different demand mm. patterns and different structural conditions for, for how we consume. Um, and that basically we need absolute targets to Me really get meaning, somewhere. Uh, what do you mean by that? Which absolute? means, so for example, a lot of environmental policy often has relative targets, which means uh -huh. um, resource... Reduce more than X percent than exact, 1990s or something. Exactly. Yeah. So f w a, a, a target which is always very beloved is resource productivity or carbon productivity, so where you basically measure the amount of production and consumption, so GDP, and then you take the amount of carbon or resource use or other problems and divide them. So you basically say how much resource use per euro or dollar or whatever earned and spent. And that's, that's usually an indicator which improves because we see relative decouplings. So you have mm -hmm. something which looks good, but as long as we have ever more production and consumption, being a little bit more efficient at it still adds up to more and more resource use. Yeah. So I think these relative targets, they are really misguiding and misleading because you need to look at the total scale of the economy and not some relative efficiencies. Yeah. And so for example, a net zero target, that's an absolute target. Yeah. If we only say we want to be 5% more efficient in 10 years, then that's mm. yeah, not that helpful. And I think that's something that in policy, I mean, we do have a net zero target, but we don't see any countries on track. Mm. So having the policy to really steer us to absolute targets, 
that's I think that's the big challenge and that's where the demand and supply side angle comes in to, to really have a multifaceted approach. Yeah. And do you think we could have um so so far the only thing that that is the limiting factor is more or less the carbon budget, right? Yes. Uh can we backtrack <coughs> it somehow to the energy needed and therefore to the materials needed to mobilize all of that? I mean, because now we were blind to only one uh metric. Mm -hmm. And I mean, coming from the MFA world, we are also blind for one metric. We we don't uh, we're not uh, having a, a good solution uh, necessarily. But do you think we could have these absolute targets as well for many other things like a mm. stock, other flows? How could we? I think GDP kind of hide. Uh, sorry, GDP um, carbon footprint and uh, carbon budget kind of hides. Well, the, yeah. the reality, right? Yes. I mean, it's just yes. one number, and it yes. doesn't tell us precisely. Yes. Well, you, if you, if you mean that, then you also mean this and mm. this and this and yes. this. Yes. Yeah. So that's a that's a wonderful question. That that's. A, I think that that would be more of a socio metabolic thinking, isn't it? So because mm. in the end, if we only talk about carbon and emissions, we always talk about the end of pipe. Yeah. Thing in the end. Um, so I mean, one of the irritating part for example is that the, <laughs> in the latest IPCC report they were really celebrating that for the first time they were able to explicitly say in the summary for policymakers that fossil fuel use has to go down because the governments <laughs> usually kick that out they also they only want to yeah, talk about yeah. emissions they don't want to talk about what goes into the system that which would be fossil fuels which would be looking at who is extracting all of that and who is buying all of that but rather only look at the, what, what happens at the end, you know, the mm. kind of the outcomes. So yeah. in that sense, looking at the inputs, I think that's the, that's the crucial starting point. Yeah. And I think the, the, the really big next step in terms of research and then also policy is to, to think about planetary boundaries in general. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we have about nine planetary boundaries ranging from uh, land use, carbon, biodiversity loss, um, nitrogen cycles, phosphorus cycles, plastic pollution, so that it, it encompasses a whole range of things. And I think we really need to think about all of these and find that the limits that they or the constraints that they place upon or should place on society. So I think coming to terms with the fact that we live on a limited planet and that we need to be able to stay within these boundaries to not wreck the biosphere, mm. I think is really important. And that connects to a lot of the other resource flows. So if biomass, for example, connects to biodiversity and land use and greenhouse gas emissions and to all the phosphorus cycles and what else, yeah. then you have um, um, things like plastic pollution, which also link to the way how we use products and what we do with all of these things. Yeah. So I think that that's definitely important and really relevant because the, the climate debate is super crucial, but it's not the only environmental crisis that we are facing. <laughs> it's, that's the problem. That's yeah. the depressing part. Um, if you look at the biodiversity question, I think that's really dire. So all the studies we are seeing show massive drops in, in living species, like 50, 60, 80 percent loss in biodiversity in terms of how many different ones, but also how many uh, animals there are in total, how much living biomass there is in total. It's really scary mm. um, because it just, just means that we are unraveling the web of life in the end. Yeah. And uh, next to climate change, these two crises, I think they will just dominate the next decades. And they will really, they will create the, the path, the future that, that we will have and our kids will have. Yeah. Okay, we've debunked one myth, the one of uh, GDP and uh, yes. <laughs> that green growth can exist. Let's try to, to, to tackle another big challenge, circular economy. You, you put your fingers a number of time on it, um, which is the promise that more or less by this time delay, we're going to be able to tap into secondary resources and therefore it's going to help us reduce. Um, you also did with your team not only looking at all of the flows and stocks for the, the entire global economy, you also looked at how circular yes. the, the global economy is. Also, then you did it for Europe and now you have done it at a national level also. 
Could you let us know a bit what are the insights when looking at the circularity at global and also national mm -hmm. level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so a few years ago we started working on this topic and mm -hmm. uh, we, we started from the comprehensive socio-metabolic perspective, so all of the resource flows that we mentioned several times now. And you very, so, so if you go through it step by step, maybe, one of the things is that you very quickly realize that all the stuff that we eat or that we feed our animals or that we use as kind of technical energy carriers, fossil fuels, there is no circularity there to be had, <laughs> you know, because it's either burnt or yeah. digested yeah. in the end. So you could have some cascades, as they call it. But in the end, there is not much possibilities there. Mm. Then we use most of the resources. And, and, and wait, so that's uh, how much of the materials? That's half? That's basically half, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other part, we build all of these stocks. So there is not much <laughs> recycling to be had there. So we have a very tiny amount of resources really being recycled mm. and going back. So that's what we call the input recycling rate. How much of all the resources that we use is actually secondary materials. Mm. And there, depending on the country, you will find something like 5 to 10% of input circularity. That, that's the top we could... Yeah. I mean, you could improve it, but you yeah. have these systemic barriers. So as long as we have an energy system like that, as long as we build so much stocks, mm. there is limits there. Mm. Um, the other part is that, that so that quickly turned, that, that turns the perspective around to, to what we do with all of these resources. On the output side, you also again see the emissions. We can discuss if carbon capture and storage is circular or not. <laughs> I don't Probably. know. <laughs> I'm, I'm not convinced. Then we can discuss about better management of, of kind of biomass waste and excreta and whatnot, but mm. that's also quite limited. Um, then we have a lot of the products, like, I don't know, our cars, our furniture, our cell phones. Mm. I think these more what we call short-lived products. That's where circularity, especially in its broader vision, has has good potentials, I would mm. say. So the the broader vision that I would that I see in the circular economy is that it it connects a lot of existing thinking into a new narrative. Yeah, I think that's important to realize. It's not really new, but it's a new <laughs> narrative on top of a lot of good thinking already. And yeah. basically, I would say that a lot of if you start at the beginning, or Let's turn it around. I, one very good paper by Nancy Bocken. Mm -hmm. She had a very good conceptualization. So she basically says it's about narrowing cycles. It's about slowing cycles. And it's about closing the cycles. So what does this mean? Narrowing means better design, uh, light weighting, material efficiency, um, maybe even refusing to buy stuff. You know, All of these things which make what we need less. And then we have the slowing of the cycles, which basically means being able to repair, to reuse, refurbishing, um, all of these things. So I think and this design for longer, yes, lifetime, design yeah. for longer lifetimes, and, and 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 having maybe longer warranties on products, all of these things. And I think these are really, really important. These are really important. And then you have the closing of the loops, which often, I mean, in the end, it's about recycling. You know, yeah. and recycling is a good thing. You know, um, we need more recycling, but it's an end of pipe solution mm. in the end because you need to collect all of that stuff, you need to sort it, you need to pump energy into it to separate materials out. You will never get impurities out. Yeah. So th there is limits to how well you can really close cycles. You know, we are really good at doing that for, for example, p for PET bottles. Mm. We are pretty good at that, or maybe glass bottles. But for many other materials, it's just a mess. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it, there is too many compounds. There is too many alloys. There is too many nothing mixed is standard things. as well. Yes, I mean, yeah. nothing standardized. If you look, for example, imagine a periodic table. <laughs> Two-thirds of the periodic table are in our electronics yeah. in minor quantities, you know, like tiny, tiny quantities. You never will get the rare earths out again or the technology-critical elements. It's just you can get a little bit of that stuff back, but yeah. in the end, that's really not, not the big lever, I would say. Yeah, I would add another circle, which is greening the circle as well. 
You mean the bio the bio loop? No, mm. not only, but I mean, mm. uh, you know, per se, circular economy is not environmental friendly, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's also something that, well, I mean, if we just close our eyes and go straight for circular economy, there's going to be some small disasters happening yes. because we, we haven't foreseen them. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's for me that's one of the tensions with that concept. So I think that in this broader conceptual vision, it has transformative potential. Mm. But then we are confronted with existing power relations, <laughs> which basically means that a lot of greenwashing is happening, that a lot of companies are jumping on board to have a good image and maybe they close some circles and maybe they design a little bit better. But if they don't, if business models are not changing yeah. and you are just recycling your plastic bags, how circular is that, you know? Or if you have a great, I don't know, we had recently, we had a talk from a big company and they were very proud that they were recycling the paper cups in their cafeteria and that they were giving kind of uh, stuff to their employees, but their business model was about selling fossil fuels. <laughs> you know, So in, in that sense, one has to be really careful yeah. and really look at what is happening there. What is the so-called circular solution happening? And there is a very big um, uh, clothing company that we all know that yeah. has that yeah, has yeah, yeah. The <laughs> two letters. <laughs> and they brand, they are a big sponsor of the circular economy thing in Europe. Yeah. And they brand themselves as that. And then if you look at it very closely, it's usually the shopping bags that are recycled plastics. And that's it, you know. So that's the problem. And I think the other part is that the mainstream discussion on circular economy often interprets it as a new business growth opportunity. Yeah, And obviously, as long as we have that kind of economic system, there needs to be business opportunities. But as long as it's always seen as a growth issue, so additional business to the yeah. existing one, then we need more and more resources because the decoupling is not happening at the rate and scale as we would need it. You know, yeah. So there is this tension between this idea of growing the economy but actually reducing at the same time and that's why i think it's really important for us as a field yeah. to be active in that space because industrial ecology and metabolism research has really great methods and concepts on offer really great data to really tackle this topic on on many different levels from the product scale for the company for the globe for the national economy yeah. and to bring these together I think is a crucial task and that's also why, for example, recently um, we as a society decided to form a new section which is called uh, Sustainable Circular Economy. Mm -hmm. It's going to be launched in the next two or three months and it will be a discussion space for everyone who is involved or interested in the circular economy to develop these concepts further and to bring kind of more robust insights into these discussions and to counter some of the greenwashing and to yeah. Um, let's because say. most of it is just back of the envelope calculations from <laughs> highly paid consultants uh, so so far. <laughs> yes, exactly. In the end, very often it ends up to issues like that and very often it ends up to be case studies of things where you can achieve a lot and then people extrapolate from that that everything can be like that. <laughs> but that's, that's cherry picking a little bit. So. Yeah. Nothing against these people working on it. I mean, they're they're really trying, but I think industrial ecology, with a firm grounding in the physical reality or thermodynamics, mm. I think has really important contributions here on what does it mean to have these cycles, what are the energy requirements, what are the supply chain implications, what are the multiple environmental issues attached to it. What are the unintended consequences? And yeah, I think we yeah, can yeah. we can model these things and we can show these things and therefore really help decision makers and activists and um, interested people to to understand what to make of this concept and and how to bring it into a transformative pathway instead of a greening business as usual <laughs> pathway, which will lead to climate disaster. You mentioned just now transformative pathways. I think that's uh, perhaps a nice segue because I'm thinking, of course, of, you know, as we said before, there is a certain uh, structural dependency that if we, you have a certain stock in the future, you'll probably consume something as well. Um, how do you foresee 
the transitions and the and the transformations in the near future i mean of course this is highly highly uh, linked with political will mm -hmm. and political decisions but from from what you have studied and how you have seen year after year you know all of the data points adding up yes uh, <laughs> the curves going up most of the time <laughs> um let's imagine that we want to orchestrate a transformation mm -hmm. What are some of these leverage points that we can activate quite easily in order to to have like a big impact? Mm -hmm. Well, easily, that's that's a that's an important adjective. But um, <laughs> well, let, let, let's maybe not let's easy, maybe yeah. start with with kind of basically mainstream answers also before yeah. we go into more more yeah. broader ideas. But I would think that the idea of a socio-ecological tax reform. Mm -hmm which has been around from environmental economics for decades now. I even looked at the first European environmental strategy from the beginning of the 90s where they already showed that this would be good. Uh -huh. I think that's a really important leverage point because in the end, currently, we are creating most of the tax base of economies comes from taxing labor mm. and not from taxing resources and resource use. So and um, so OECD has shown that that basically most of the high income countries, a few percent of their budget comes from environmental taxes. <laughs> if you think about it, it's crazy, isn't it? What's yeah. the incentive? The incentive is to save people, to kind of uh, get rid of right jobs. now, right? Exactly. I mean, if we're really trying just to do that, then... Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. So if the incentive is to, to save or to get rid of people because they're expensive and resources are cheap what, what are companies going to do you know basically they have to use more resources yeah. and not save on them you know so i think here shifting the tax base towards resource use towards emissions and also towards getting companies and the rich people to actually pay their taxes would really be an important thing because kind of there is a lot of economic incentives and they, they do work to some extent so i think mm -hmm. that's really an important leverage point the other part I think is is basically regulation. Mm -hmm. So, product standards, um, producer responsibilities for repair services, uh, for extended lifetimes, to have all these things in place to basically set set the boundaries. To say, if you want to sell products here, they have to be long lasting. They have to be repairable. They have to be highly efficient. And yes, they will cost a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the long, entire lifetime, usually you save so much with yeah. more efficient products, you know. So I think that's a, that's really important shifts, and that's not even a radical proposal. That's kind of the classical that any economist would probably subscribe to that. The question then is always how much vested interests are there and how well they are able to kind of soften these measures, as we yeah. have with the European emissions trading system, which has been undermined by vested mm -hmm. interests. Yeah? Um, so these are these these would be helpful, I think, and this would already help a lot. And then the third part, I would say, is we need to look at the what we call the structural conditions mm. of everyday life. So um, in two weeks, we will launch the uh, special assessment report on climate friendly living for Austria, mm -hmm. and we looked at a lot of what we call structures going from infrastructure, mobility patterns, but also the legal system yeah. and the norms and uh, the um, um, stuff like how do we do, what are the rules for advertisement you know what are the the all of these things so there is a lot of these institutions and norms in society which kind of govern how we can live so if we look at these step by step and I think there is a lot of leverage points also there. So, mm. I mean, infrastructure is a pretty obvious one, you know, the example with the roads, that's easy to understand, you know. But it uh, it also goes deeper, you know. So there is a, a small example for legislation is, you know, that all the we have all these expiration dates on our food and they are not driven by how long that stuff <laughs> really lasts. They are living, they are driven by the worry that the producers could get sued. Yeah if one of the things goes bad too early. So they have, a, you know, that, that the incentive there is not to have food which can last longer, but rather to avoid any lawsuits and to manufacture everything for that market. So I think that's, that's another point. 
uh, or just an example basically of, of how rules then influence our decisions. Uh. Yeah. So I think a lot of these things can happen, can help. And then on the other hand, I mean, the, the scale of the transformation that we need. So basically, if we want to achieve the Paris goals, we need to reduce emissions by six to 10% per year. Yeah. That has never happened in history. And you know? during COVID, it was what, four or five? Yes, so exactly. It, so it means a COVID every year. Yeah, and that, but that's not that's that that's that that was a disaster. That was yeah. no transformation, and that 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 was just uh, horrible. Um, um, so I think here also again, what what I find also interesting is that setting clear targets again, maybe absolute targets, mm. is really important. So for I really enjoy the the, the phase out discussion. So until when are you allowed to sell fossil fueled cars? Yeah. If there is a clear target and if it's credible that in 10 years you cannot sell that anymore and yes, there will be a second-hand market but all the companies know it's going to be over. Yeah. And I think these signals are super crucial because mm. the price mechanisms alone, you would need to increase some prices so much to really get these results that the social side effects would be very, very big. Yeah. So that the classical economist approach of pricing, I think it has its limit and it, it needs the regulation, it needs the clear targets, it need, needs, there need to be clear phase out strategies, there need to be work with, with the unions and with the companies to understand how can we create new jobs mm -hmm. for, I mean, we are talking about the entire car manufacturing industry which has to shrink massively yeah. and change massively. Um, and that's just one example where we really see that there is a lot of change required. And I think that's really important to build these alliances and to understand how, for example, working time reduction can help our well-being and the environment, how um, creating different jobs, different skills, different programs can help, how you can basically get capital to, to contribute its share to that kind of transformation because there is immense amounts of capital out there, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> we, we often forget where we're going to get the money. Don't worry, the money yeah, is that there. The yeah. money is there, you know. All the, all the economic growth of the last 30 years <laughs> basically has gone to capital because real wages are stagnating, you know. So there is huge amounts of money and I think it's really important to to get those wealthy actors uh, to to address them basically and to to make them contribute their share because they are profiting from our society and they are rich because we are all here you know <laughs> so now that's that's their turn so i think i mean that's a tough nut to crack and that's yeah. maybe more more out there than with than the measures i proposed in the beginning <laughs> Um, perhaps as, as a wrap-up, a uh, big question, I think. So we are perhaps at the cusp or in the middle of a transition or a tipping point or something like that. Um, one of the big elements of um, socioeconomic metabolism are socioeconomic or sociometabolic regimes. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of uh, socio-metabolic regimes. Could you just n quickly name them and then do you envision us going into another regime soon uh, is that the case for all of the countries and yeah, yeah I mean mm -hmm. I'd love to have your your thoughts on that and there's a small side question a friend of mine told me uh, ah, you're gonna meet uh, with Dominic and social metabolic regimes so you should ask him um, is there a, a structural dependency in terms of pathways going from agrarian to industrial mm -hmm. like are you as, as but uh, I'm, I'm going too far ahead okay, already well, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let, let, let us start with the, <laughs> with the basics, so to say, or with the ideas. So the, this idea of socio-metabolic regime goes back to, to earlier work, uh, looking at society-nature interactions. So understanding that nature or the planetary system is a complex self-adaptive system. We have a climate system which interacts with the biosphere and stabilizes to some extent. That's why the human race could actually evolve like we <laughs> did because we had a very stable climate for exactly the time where humans went from being basically apes to hunter-gatherers to what where we are now and that yeah. was a very specific time where the temperature was very very stable at a range which was really good for our kind of species yeah 
you look at the long term history, it has been very different also before that. So I think that's important to realize. And then, as we said, society organizes its resource use to reproduce itself. Mm -hmm. And in this, what we then say is that society nature interacts. So the way we use resources, the way we gather energy and materials influences our social organization. So as a hunter-gatherer society, we call that an uncontrolled solar energy regime, which basically means <laughs> that stuff just grows and <laughs> animals just exist, you know, and you take and you gather what is there, but you yeah. don't influence everything on a large scale. And that, that brings a certain social organization with it. You have to be mobile to do that. You have to follow the seasons. <laughs> You have to have small groups because you cannot gather so much. So that's very specific. And then the transition to the agrarian regime um, means that suddenly people start to colonize the land. They start to burn down forests on a large scale. They start farming. They need to build cities. They need to b build walls to defend yeah. themselves. <laughs> you know, so there is a lot of social implications again. And then that the agrarian regime was a very long period of time until fossil fuels really kicked in. And mm. that basically, to some extent, liberated us also from the constraints... Of labor-intensive tasks and stuff Exactly, like that, yeah. and the constraints of land. Because yeah. suddenly we were not entirely dependent on what is growing, mm. but we could harvest what has grown millions of years before, Yeah, basically. The subterranean and forest. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so that's for me, that was really fascinating to learn that. And so the regime always is the idea that there is this kind of stable phase. Mm. So the agrarian society is rather stable. And from the historical studies that have been done, you can actually see that these kinds of social formations, they have very specific and clear resource use patterns. So how much they extract and use. And usually you see something like the f like a factor 5 to factor 10 increase in resource use between the regimes. So mm. when hunter-gatherers use like 1 to 2 tons per year per person, the agrarian society would be something like 5 to 10. And then we go up to where we are right now, which can range from 10 to 30, 40, 50 mm. tons per capita. And this has very different implications, obviously, for the land. With the fossil fuels, suddenly we can transform the entire planet, which before wasn't feasible because you had people to dig and you had some <laughs> animals to, you know, help you dig, basically. But that's all you could do. So obviously the scale at which we could impact the planetary system w was much different. Yeah. And the speed as well, of course. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And with the fossil fuels, I think the interesting thing is we could now debate if we actually, if there is a stable regime, or if we are actually in the midst of the transition, mm. because fossil fuel use has really catapulted us into a new way of living, but it's not a system that can be stable because climate change will wreck us, and fossil fuels at some point will run <coughs> out. So, from a more long-term perspective, you might say, okay, this might be more like an intermediate stage, mm. where hopefully we are able to fully jump to renewable technologies and preserve a high living standard or collapse. Mm. If you look at history, a lot of societies have collapsed mm. after a long time. And I mm. think that's really important to see that this is a real possibility. Not, I'm, I'm not talking about the extinction of humanity that's not on the yeah. table, but the, yeah. the, the collapse of the way we organize our living, maybe the collapse of the middle class, yeah. the collapse of the high well-being we have in, in many places. So there is a lot to lose, and that's a real possibility mm -hmm. um, because climate change is advancing fast, the biodiversity crisis is advancing fast, and the world is busy fighting wars and quarreling about all kinds of things. So, yeah. um, so in that sense, yeah, I think the regime idea really helps you to understand that this not everything is specific and singular, but actually there is some s pretty consistent patterns that you can find. and. Taking it one step further, I mean, I don't have the exact numbers on top of my head, but let's say a third to half of the global population is basically at in the transition from an agrarian to an industrial fossil fuel lifestyle. So the, there is the acceleration still to be had and the whole idea of leapfrogging yeah. into a green regime could work if the high income countries really want to because we have the technology we have the money 
we have the institutions, but we, and we also we show the example because yes. right now there is no absolute example as well of this regime, right? I mean, yes. you call it the green regime. I, I don't know if there is mm. that's uh, an official name or. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see, you know, how do you set the example? What would be if we go back to the absolute targets as well? Mm. If we're now to 10 to 30 tons per capita, yeah. then what would be this new regime yes. in order to be sustainable enough for, yeah. you know, yeah. 5,000 years or so? Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think, I mean, that's, uh, that's also a lot of the work happening here in the field. Also here at the conference, we've seen some amazing studies in this direction, exploring how much materials we will need in the future to have a green uh, power system, uh, energy system, uh, how much materials we might need to build enough infrastructure around the world. So all of this work is happening in the society and I mm. think it's, it's really exciting to see in the end that supplying everyone with a sufficient, decent, proper provisioning with food, living space, health, education, whatnot, is easily feasible within <laughs> planetary boundaries. <laughs> what is not feasible is to have huge inequalities continue. What is not feasible to have a Western high consumption lifestyle for everyone. These are the things that are not feasible, but yeah. it's, it's not about, it, how to say this, so eradicating poverty mm. on this planet is not the problem for the environment. Mm. It's what the rich people like us here yeah. in the West and yeah. people who listen to this podcast probably yeah. <laughs> count here because, you know, we all have computers and Internet and yeah. stuff like that. So in, in, in that big picture, these kinds of lifestyles, lifestyles is not a good word, actually, but kind of the regime we live in, mm -hmm. that's not feasible to be globalized. And yeah. I think that's really important to see. And many studies show that many studies also show, for example, really interesting relations so that so human well-being if you have very little energy and materials well-being is usually not so great yeah not so surprising but what is really interesting to see is that at the kind of intermediate level of resource use you get immense gains in well-being and then at higher levels of resource use like here in the west yeah you don't see gains in well-being anymore. You just see more resource use. Yeah, so and there is also stuff. a saturation curve as there well. There is a yeah. massive saturation curve yeah. there. Um, and I think that's also, again, important to understand. A good life doesn't need to wreck the planet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. um, endless growth and high consumption, that's wrecking the planet. And high inequality is also wrecking the planet. Yeah. So these are combined crises, so to say, or combined challenges. That, that really kind of give us the space within which we could operate safely on, on this planet and, and have some kind of sustainable regime where not everything will be wonderful, but at least yeah. uh, we could supply the basic needs and we could tackle climate change. So all of these things are really feasible. So, mm. um, but um, yeah, it depends on the on the political pressure applied. It depends on social actors it depends on civil society it depends on science it depends on those ambitious politicians who actually understand the planetary crisis we're in um to really affect this change and and to to achieve achieve this because it's feasible but mm -hmm. not 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 <laughs> automatically done <laughs> and not just delivered by the market yeah <laughs> is there any other last topic you you would like to to discuss about something that we we didn't talk about and you think is essential to be shared or well i i what I, what i would like to share is that i invite anyone to join the society to <laughs> check out our material we have a great homepage we have teaching materials there we have resources there uh, obviously we have a lot of scientific publications but they are maybe not so exciting to <laughs> <laughs> all the time <laughs> But I think it's there is really interesting stuff to be had here, mm. and and I would welcome anyone who's interested uh, to check these things out. So the International Society for Industrial Ecology, that's the full name here. Yeah, and I'm very happy to be here and to have this great talk with you. Before we go, is there any other um, uh, 
I don't know, either a message or a book you would like to recommend or something you would like to, to mm. put out to the people who listen? I would, I would, uh, for an entry into this kind of thinking, I would actually really recommend Kate Rayworth's mm. uh, Donut Economics. I think that's a really great book to get into and it's it contains a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about. Also, um, maybe as a second offer, Tim mm. Jackson has been writing some yeah. great stuff, Prosperity Without Growth, for example, and a few other recent books. I think that's really good entry literature which, which summarizes a lot of these things in, in an accessible format. And I haven't planned it, but Kate Rios, I think, was episode 30 or something. Oh, like wow, that. wonderful. And Tim yes. Jackson was also here, so I don't remember what uh, episode, but just look them up. You'll, you'll find the discussions. I'm pretty sure they, uh, they will provide something insightful as well. Well, I think we have covered many things, uh, Dominic. Thanks so much for, uh, for this discussion. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks as well, everyone, to, to listening and watching until the end. And don't hesitate. I mean, if you have other questions, if you have other suggestions how to get into this new regime, just write to us, write in the comments, and we would like to still engage because I think there is, it's a novel, still a topic of research, and I think there is much to learn uh, for that. So thanks again and uh, thank you <laughs> and we'll meet in 2 weeks for another episode. Cheers.